Well, we want to welcome you today. If you're visiting with us, we just saw the commercial, the, the promotion. We're starting a brand new series next Sunday, Nothing Less Than God's Best. Many times, uh, sometimes the series will sync up one to another. We'll finish a series, then we'll start a series, like boxcars, if you will, and the train's rolling. However, on this one, we finished one a couple of weeks ago. Last weekend was a standalone message, and I talked about how we are known by God, and he knows your need, and he knows your name. And by the way, if you missed last Sunday, last Sunday we did something unusual, kind of out of the box for us, but we brought the 9 o'clock and the 11 o'clock together at 10 o'clock. And it, for me, this is just me, and I'm, I'm the campus pastor, and I'm the preacher, but for me it's been my favorite service since Renee and I arrived here three and a half years ago. Last Sunday was just unreal. I just loved it, and who knows, maybe we'll have the opportunity to do it again every so often. We'll see what happens, but it was, it was, it, it was very, very exciting. But that was on the end of... On the end of my daughter getting married on the night before, and, the, and, the, and earlier that week, I had two or three different preaching assignments. And I got to tell you that uh, last weekend, by the time Sunday rolled around, and when, then we still had to unpack a lot of stuff. If you were at the wedding or if you were serving at the wedding, all of those 25 tables, and we had 217 people, I believe, at the reception, 25, 26 tables, and all of the place settings and all of the, all of the decorations, Renee has been on, like Indiana Jones. She's been on a quest for the ark. We've been on a quest for all of those decorations. So all of those decorations had to go back to our home. And I, I can't say that they're properly placed at this point. They're in our garage. They're there. Thank you, thank you, Jesus. But nevertheless, there's been all kinds of stuff happening. And as a preacher, even though I probably have between two to 3,000 ser sermons that I've written over the 29 years being in full-time ministry, and I've got, I've got most of them. I've got them in boxes, and I've got, them, I've got them all over the place. Rarely, every so often, but rarely do I ever kind of go back and kind of pull something out. Now, this will be. Every so often, there might be a now word that was a now, a now word maybe at a time gone by, and it fits the season and the situation right now, but rarely has that happened. So I pretty well write a brand new message every week, and if I'm preaching two or three times, I'm writing two or three messages. So this week, because we're starting a new series next week, this week is a standalone message. But I gotta tell you, when I sat down Wednesday afternoon at my home office, and sometimes I'll write my messages here, sometimes I'll write them at home, sometimes it's, it's more quiet there, and I can think better, and I, I've got all my Bibles there, I got Bibles here as well, but I had five Bibles opened up. I mean, that's pretty impressive, right? Five Bibles, just not one Bible, not just two Bibles, but five Bibles opened up. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, no, no. And I was completely, I was almost like numb because there was the wedding, there was the, the big Sunday, there was the unpacking, there is this, 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 and all of these things. And I was feeling completely uninspired. And sometimes after you have big events in your life, you can kind of feel like you're running on empty. And, and you need time to recover. And I gotta tell you, as a preacher and as a dad, I felt like I was in a recovery Wednesday afternoon. I was looking at the Bible and just staring at me, kind of like that, just the black and white print. I wasn't getting anything. And sometimes you gotta recover. As a, as a dad and as a preacher last Wednesday, man, I was recovering emotionally because I, gave, I have three daughters. She was the first one to get married, Kennedy the oldest. And man, that's emotional, man. It was emotional uh, being part of that, walking her down, and then being part of the ceremony and everything else. So there was an emotional recovery. There was a physical recovery. I was like, man, that was exhausting. And I'm not recovered from this yet. I have recover I'm recovering on those other, but this one's a longer term, a financial recovery. Can I get an amen? <laughs> those weddings will take you to the brink, hallelujah. I'm on the brink right now, hallelujah. That's why you gotta keep continue to put God first, amen. That's a good place to say amen. That's a great place to say amen. Amen, well, I'm gonna go on anyway. And so I sat there, and I really didn't get anything, which is kind of unusual. Like I said, I've been doing this a long time, and I've kind of worked this out with the Lord. And I enjoy the pursuit, and I enjoy the process of writing sermons. But Wednesday afternoon, I was like, my goodness. But just before we were leaving to go to Freedom Night in America, and man, if you missed it last Wednesday night with that Riley Gaines, she was phenomenal. 
that is worth your while to go back and watch what she had to say about the controversy that she was involved in and everything else. She was so well-spoken and just was able to articulate a common sense side to some of these things that, that are unfolding, not just at the meet that she was in, but basically across the country in athletic departments all across the land. It's scary, and it's, I can't even believe we're having the conversation. Anyway, by the time we were leaving, I started to get it, and not unsurprisingly, many times when I preach, it's either something that I've just dealt with or that I'm dealing with or that God is even proactively preparing me and I'll find myself preaching a message that two weeks down the road, I was like, huh, well, I, I, I guess that's what that was for. And as God began to deal with my heart uh, Wednesday afternoon, by the time I sat down on Thursday, God spoke something to me for me, but I feel like I'm going to share it with you today. And my title this morning is simply, Just Be There. Just Be There. And I find this in Matthew chapter 6, and I'm going to read from the message paraphrase. There's a lengthy portion before I get to the actual title, but follow along with me. It says, be especially careful when you're trying to do good so that you don't make a performance out of it. That might be good theater. But the God who, who made you won't be applauding. Uh, when you do something for someone, don't call attention to yourself. You've seen them in action, I'm sure, play actors. I call them treating prayer, a prayer meeting and street corner alike as a stage acting as compassionate as long as someone is watching. Basically a photo op. Playing to the crowds, they get applause. It's true, but that's all they'll get. And when you help someone out, don't, do, uh, don't just think about it, but just do it. Now, let me just, I highlighted that because for me, naturally, that's my wheelhouse right there. Those kinds of thoughts, those kinds of titles, those kinds of themes because I'm task-oriented. Give me a job. Yes, sir, I'm a good soldier. I can take my commands. I can take my orders. Give me a job. I'm going to get it done. You don't, have to, you, you don't have to follow up with me. I'm going to do it. The Bible actually says we're all to be like that. It, it says in, in Proverbs chapter 6, go to the ant, you sluggard, who does not need a, a captain over it or an authority figure, somebody to basically make sure that they're getting it done because the ant is going to get it done, and we are to be ant-like that, in, in that regard. And I'm like, oh, okay, 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 because I was reading through this, and I'm like, yeah, just do it, just do it. Like, that's me through and through and through, especially anyone in here has read the birth order book by Kevin, Dr. Kevin Lehman, and I'm a firstborn, and man, there, there, there's pluses and minuses, there's things that are neutral, but I'm classically, for better and for worse, a firstborn. There's an upside to that, there's a downside to that. But among other things, firstborns are like, take charge, let's go, we're gonna get it done. We're, gonna, we're taking this past the one yard line, we're going in for a touchdown, unlike what the cards will probably do today. <laughs> we'll know, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, amen. So anyway, anyway, I thought, well, yeah, 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 but that's, that's the issue. And that sometime is, for me anyway, my very undoing, because I wanna go, let's go, let's go, let's go. So reading on. That is the way that your God, who conceived you in love, working behind the scenes, helps you out. When you come before God, don't turn it into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show of their prayers, hoping for their 15 minutes of fame. Do you think that God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Notice this. Just be there. As simply and honestly as you can imagine, as you can manage. Now notice this. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. And if you and I will put this into practice, and if we will do what the word says here, just be there, something supernatural will begin to happen. There is a shift that occurs and in those moments, there's an exchange, there's, there, there's an encounter, there, there's an experience in the presence of God where you will begin to sense his grace. This morning, I, I, when I felt like I was running on empty, and I knew that God was going to refresh me, and God was going to recalibrate me, God was going to replenish me, I knew that, I know that. 
But in that moment, instead of just going, going, and, and I was bound and determined, I was going to write this sermon. I was going to will it out. I was going to, like, grind it out. Arr, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this sermon. And God's like, that works for you sometimes, Todd. But right now, it ain't happening. And I had to learn again that sometimes you just, and it's a cliche, but there's a lot of truth to it. Sometimes you got to let go and let God and just be there. So for the next few minutes, I, I want to talk about amazing grace. It says that you will begin to sense his grace. And grace can be one of those words in our vocabulary that it can kind of all be thrown into this blender, hit puree, and it, what is it? And there's all kinds of definitions, and there's all kinds of labels. There's all kinds of understanding sometimes that support it or actually unsupport it. It doesn't support it at all, but people just kind of kind of have thrown it all in there. I read a book a number of years ago by Philip Yancey. On, it's called The Jesus I Never Knew. And the eighth chapter is under the, under the heading of Mission, A Revolution of Grace, because that's essentially what Jesus came for to bring a revolution of grace. He was a revolutionary of grace, the embodiment of that revolution. And what he did, man, he really upset the apple cart because the Jews in their day, they, they, they had a hierarchy system, a, a, a caste system, a class system. And you were this close to God if you could attain this, and you were this close and this level and all this kind of stuff. But what Jesus did, he came in, he flipped that whole script, and basically he leveled the playing field and he said, all are welcome. Listen, there's a place at the table for you. There, 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 there's a spot that God has reserved with your name on it. And it really upset the religious figures of the day because Jesus came and represented and brought a revolution of grace. So I want to talk very briefly today about five different things that I, this week, as I thought about it, associated with grace. And one would be probably the most familiar. Number one, a grace that saves it says in Ephesians 2, and I won't read all the scripture, but essentially it says that we're saved by grace. And not of our works, it, it is the gift of God. And why is that? It, it's so that none of us can boast. Look what I did. Look how hard I worked. Lord, I, I did this, this, and this. Therefore, I deserve God's righteousness. I, I deserve God's favor. I deserve all of the blessings that God has. And here's the thing. God... He, he's not going for that. And here's, I, I, I'm, I'm all for having a great work ethic. I'm all for getting busy. I'm all for not being a bystander, sitting on the sidelines, just kind of being a, a Monday morning quarterback and criticizing everybody else who's trying to get something done. Absolutely not. But at the end of the day, we are not saved by our works. We're saved because God is benevolent. God is merciful. God is compassionate. God is loving. God has a heart for you. And it's that grace that saves us, no matter how hard you work, no matter how hard you try, no matter how deserving you might be in the eyes of everyone else, no matter if you take all of your lifetime good works and put them all on the table and say, check it out, God, all of those good works are still not good enough. And we're saved by grace. And I love it that it's a level playing field for you and it's a level playing field for me. No matter what you've done or no matter what you haven't done. And God has grace enough to cover us and to cleanse us and to change us and to save us. And then it goes on to say here in Ephesians 2.10 that once we are saved by that grace, there are there are, we are saved for his, we are his workmanship. And that is a Greek term, poema, from which we get the English term poem. And you've got to understand that once you get saved and you give your life to Jesus, your life, it doesn't become perfect. It doesn't become problem-free, stress-free. That's not real life. You're still going to have challenges. You're still going to have bad days. You're still going to have things when things go, are going in the opposite direction of the direction you hope that they would go. That said... 
unless you have Jesus in your life, your life will never fully make sense. It will never fully synchronize. And it's only the saving grace that allows us to understand that we are the poema, we are the poems, and we have, there's a rhyme and a reason, a harmony that fills our lives and floods our lives, and we begin to make sense of this life. And, and that poyama gives us meaning, and it gives us dreams and hopes and destinies, and the heart of God becomes the heart of man. It, a God we begin to take our pulse and it's the, it's the heartbeat of God that is beating within us. But that doesn't happen until you experience the saving grace. Number two, it's a grace that seeks. And I really like this one because I've experienced this seeking grace. It says in Jeremiah 31.20, 31.2 I should say, thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword, they found grace in the wilderness. And I don't know about you, but I've had periods of my life, sometimes sadly, by my own choices and the consequences that I provoked, because choices provoke, provoke consequences, for better or for worse, and because of bad choices I made, I found myself at extended seasons in my life in the wilderness. I found myself sometimes when I, I grew up in a great Christian home. You've heard my testimony many times. Godly mother and father grew up in church, Sunday school, you name it. Crusader of the year, man, in 1973. Go Todd. And yet, and yet, in my late teens and early 20s, went a completely different direction. Bouncer in a nightclub, partying all the time denying God, betraying God, turned my back on my upbringing, my faith, and everything else, and yet found grace in the wilderness, a grace that sought me out. In the message paraphrase, it talks about they were out looking for a place to rest, and notice I got this highlighted. They met God out looking for them. And many times we say, and it's not inaccurate, and you don't have to say, oh man, I regret ever saying that. I didn't know what I was saying. But we do say, I found God. What happened to you, Todd? Well, I found God. No, here's the reality. God found Todd. God found me. In the most obscure, in the most barren, in the most desolate, in the most desperate times of my life, in those seasons that I was responsible for placing myself in, and yet God sought me out. The Bible says in the New Testament about Peter, who betrayed Christ basically to his feet, uh, to his face, and knew it. Jesus said, you're going to do it. He's like, no, not me. Everybody else, these guys are losers. I'm a winner. I'll never deny you. And yet, who is that? Well, I don't know who that is. Hmm, no, no, I'm not with him. Not at all. Denies Christ, betrays Christ, but upon resurrection, what happens? Jesus goes looking for Peter. And let me tell you what, I've been Peter too many times. God has come looking for me. He's found me. He's restored me. He's redeemed me. He's loved me. He has saved me. Can somebody say amen? So it's a grace that seeks. Number three, it's a grace that, that sustains. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, this is the portion of Scripture where Paul, who used to be Saul, who hated anybody associated with Christ, that basically he is, he's got them in the crosshairs, wants to take them out, wants to take them down, wants to basically eradicate the earth of anybody who are followers of Christ, followers of the way, man. He was, he was, he was, he was after it and after them. Wanted to haul them away, throw them in jail, and worse. And yet he has this conversion. He sees the light. He, he has, the, he has this, this, this epiphany. His world is rocked and changed, and he basically, in the process, has his name changed from Saul to Paul. And I mean, he's walking with God, and he's rocking in ministry, and, and lives are being changed, and history's being written, and people don't even know what to think about it. And, and, and God is using him undeniably, powerfully, it, miraculously. It's like, what is going on with this guy? And yet he has this thorn in his flesh and he's praying. And you gotta believe that Paul's prayer life was pretty dialed in. I, gotta, I, I think that's, pretty, that's a reasonable assumption. He had it dialed in, folks. And he prays once, twice, three times. He's like, God, 
I've got this thorn in the flesh, and there's a lot of speculation what it was or what it wasn't. We won't, we, we, we won't have that conversation. Nevertheless, it was painful. It was hurtful. It was difficult. It wasn't pleasant at all. It's like, oh, goody, I got a thorn in the flesh. No, 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 no. This was tough, and this was a test. But here's what the Lord said. He said, my grace is sufficient. I'm not going to remove it, but I'm going to give you a revelation in the midst of this time, in the midst of this trial. And this revelation is actually going to be greater than the difficulty that you're experiencing. It doesn't remove the difficulty, but it's going to give you what you need to overcome it in the midst of it. Without, without taking it away, and I shared this in the first service. At 8.50 this morning, I was getting mic'd up at the back. And Jeff, uh, one of our captains on our hospitality team, and he said, Pastor, he's like, I don't know if I should bring this to you or not. I know you're getting ready to preach. But there's a mom here that just showed up and she's distraught because last night her son was shot and killed. And do you think you could speak with her just for a moment? And I wrestled with it, folks. I'm like, oh. I, I, I. And I said, yes, yes, yes. I said, get Janet Heyman. Meet me over here where the Spanish interpretation room is. And Janet and I went over and we met with her. And what do you say? Listen, I've been pastoring a long time. I, I know some of the Bible, not all of the Bible. I know some of the Bible. I know how to comfort and counsel people and offer them encouragement and consolation through the, through the Word of God, which is what it's for. But in those moments, folks, if you've never done it, it it's, it's a different level especially with, with a parent that has lost a child. And so everything is fresh. They had lunch yesterday. He asked her yesterday, Mom, pick me up for church today. They were coming to church this morning. He was killed last night. So in the absence of having the right words, and not that, the, not that words could take away the pain or remove the grief and the sense of loss, and I explained to the mom, I said, by the way, I said, grief is a very natural thing. The Bible talks about there's a time to sing, there's a time to dance, but there's a time to grieve and there's a time to mourn. And I said, don't resist that. You don't have to suppress that. And, and she was, I prayed with her. Janet stayed with her. She was in the service, in the 9 o'clock service. And then as she left, she stopped at the door, and I, I touched base with her again. And we're going to make sure that she doesn't walk through this season alone. But the only conclusion, the only conclusion, the only ground that I can stand on solidly in a moment like that, in a situation like that, or anything else that, that is so devastating in nature that it, it's, it's traumatic. It, it, it takes literally the, the life and the breath out of you because of whatever potential loss or, the, or experience. The only thing I know is that in those moments, because I've lost loved ones myself, the only thing that I know is that there is a grace that sustains it doesn't remove the hurt. It doesn't remove the thorn. It doesn't remove the sense of loss or the sense of grief or mourning. And yet, and yet, and yet, and I'm not trying to placate this and dismiss the reality of the depth of that devastation of the death of that loved one. Absolutely not. But what I'm saying is even when it gets as bad as it can possibly get in that it's almost unimaginable in terms of the pain that it afflicts upon your spirit and your heart and your mind that I have found that even in those lowest of low moments, in the pit of despair, there's a grace that sustains. And you're in a season that you could have, you could have never predicted. It's a season that you never wanted. It's a season that you never welcomed. And yet, in the midst of that, God says, my grace will be sufficient. Number four, Sam, as Sam comes to the keyboard, Sammy boy. Where's Sammy? No, I'm not going on until Sam shows up. It's going to be pretty embarrassing, Sam. No. That's not fair. That's not fair. Sam, I'm going to have to buy you a Costco hot dog. <laughs> I just paid you the ultimate compliment. Because in my world, Costco hot dogs are from heaven. 
Amen. Number four, grace that strengthens. Many times when people define God's grace, the, the word that comes to people's mind, the default definition is favor. And it's not wrong. Grace means God's un, unmerited, un, undeserved favor. Absolutely. But it has another meaning as well. It means that it, there's a force behind it. There's a weight behind it. There's something, and better yet, someone behind it, backing it up. And in Acts chapter 4, it says, With great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them. And what this means in the actual Greek language means that the force of God was backing them up. They just didn't have favor. Oh, and everybody was just kind of cordial and nice and complimentary towards them. No, they were encountering some great resistance, some great challenges. People were trying to disband them, break them up, you name it. Saul was still Saul at this point. He was half crazy. He wanted to take them out. And yet there was great grace upon them. They just didn't have favor. They had the force. And if you read in the Old Testament, second last book in the Old Testament, Zechariah, a lot of people, and I love it. I was raised with this verse, especially being growing up in a Pentecostal church. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. That's Zechariah 4.6. Zechariah 4.7 talks about Zerubbabel, who was tasked with the responsibility of rebuilding the temple. And it says that, listen, here's what we need him to do with shouts of grace, grace to it. He's going to bring out the capstone. Basically, he's going to put the last stone in place. Boom. Job completed. And so he was, he was tasked to start it. And the word and the promise and the prophecy was that. He's going to see the completion of it. And he's going to have a grace to get it done. There's going to be a force of God. It's going to be sovereign. It's going to be supernatural. It, it, it's going to be something wonderful. God's going to step into that overwhelming responsibility. He's like, where do I start? What in the world? And he gets that, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord, yes. And then they said, with grace, grace, shout to it. And so many times when we think of grace, it's like, Okay, who's saying grace? You saying grace? You got a grace? Grace? We, we get at a table. I promise you, what this is implying in Zechariah chapter four was not their lunch break, and somebody was saying, "Hey, is somebody going to say grace?" No, it was much more forceful. It was much more intentional. It was much more God-centered than okay, okay, Lord bless this food, Amen. It was like this job is bigger than I am. I need the Holy Spirit. I need grace. By the way, if I'm not mistaken, I believe in Zechariah 12, the Holy Spirit is actually referenced as the Spirit of grace. I'd have to check that out. It's either chapter 10 or chapter 12. I didn't put that in my notes, but it just come to me now. The Spirit of grace. And the Holy Spirit, yeah, many times we talk about the Holy Spirit as, as a gentleman. Yes, yes, he is. But the Holy Spirit is not to be messed with. He's not to be messed with when God's work is to be done. There's a force there. There's a favor there, but there's a force there. Amen? Last thing, a grace that shields. And what I mean by this is that there are events in our lives, sometimes preemptively, proactively, we can identify on the horizon, ooh, that doesn't look good, and God shields you from that eventuality. It's like, whew. I was able to get around it, over it, under it, through it, whatever. And God was shielding me from the potential collateral damage that I would have experienced had I gone through that. God spared me from that. God shielded me from that. Yes, that, that applies to this point. But there's something else that I want to just kind of reference. And it's very abstract in its concept, but there's a grace, in my opinion, that shields us from things that we don't even know. And I think only with the benefit, not just hindsight in this life, maybe in this life, but I believe for sure in the next life, when we're standing and our life unfolds, 
And we're going to be shocked and amazed where God intervened, where we didn't even know that God was stepping in. And it was God, 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 God. And a grace shielded us. Clint Brown is one of my favorite singers, one of my favorite songwriters. He's a phenomenal preacher. The guy makes me sick. He's so awesome. But he wrote a song a number of years ago on one of his live albums. It might have been live in Orlando. I've got six or seven of his albums. And he tells this story that he was and his entire team were flying from Orlando where he pastored Faith World. And they were doing a big conference in Dallas. And uh, they decided because of the timing and everything else that they were going to rent a private jet. And so they get to the airport, and he's excited. He's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And he was very meticulous in picking out this jet. The, the knots it could fly. Is it knots in the air? I know it's knots in the water, but is it knots in the air as well? I don't know. Uh, we had some pilots here in the first service. No pilot. I don't know if we have any pilot. Miles per hour. Who, do, who the heck knows? It's going fast. Faster than driving. And he, he picked it because of this, and they, I don't know how many people they had on their team and everything else. They get to the airport, and they're like, Mr. Brown, sir, you, you can't take this one. It's not quite ready. And da, 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 da. and he was ticked. He's telling this on the live album. He's like, man, I didn't want to take another jet. And he, and he says this. He's like, man, the jet, I've, it could go 240 knots or miles per hour. He said the one they gave me could only do 220 so like, it's a small difference, but it was like, mm, I paid for the one that would go faster, and now I got the, got the one that goes go slower. But he says, he said, you know, I had no idea what I was arguing over. And he said, please, I'm not making light of the situation, but he said, this was a grace that, for whatever reason, shielded me. But he said, someone else rented. They had that plane rented, that jet ready to go later that day. And this made national news, and you can look it up later. I, I don't want to get into the details. But there was a party that was flying on it with some nationally known people. And uh, the air traffic controllers detected there's some irregularities, and they brought up two jets flying beside it, and all the windows were basically cased over and clouded over, and they couldn't make radio contact, and everybody on board was unconscious, and basically they could not salvage the plane, and the plane had to run out of gas, and it crashed, and everyone died. And Clint Brown is telling the story. He's like, I wanted that plane. I should have been on that plane. I demanded that plane, and I could have waited for that plane. And he sat down, and it's one of my favorite songs. And he wrote a song, it, If Not For Grace. And the lyrics say this, where would I be? You only know. I'm glad you see through eyes of love. A hopeless case, an empty place, if not for grace. I'm certainly no singer. I'm certainly no Clint Brown. But let me tell you what. I know this is my story. I know it's your story as well. Where would I be if not for grace? A grace that saved me. A grace that sought me out. A grace that has sustained me in seasons that didn't make sense. Of seasons of dark, difficult losses. A grace that has strengthened me when I didn't have it within me. That's when Paul says, listen, hey, even when I'm weak, then I'm strong. God showed up. God gave me what I didn't possess on my own. It was a power not of this world, but a grace that, a grace that shields me. My best friend of 40 years Surprised me. Usually in the first service, they sit in the second, third row today. It must be my mother-in-law's influence, Renee's mom. She lives with us, but Scotty and Holly. Scott, Scotty's my best friend of 41 years. Went to college together, went into business together. Now we live in the same neighborhood. I mean, it, it's, it's bizarre. And this morning, I'm like, whoa, this must be one of the seven signs in the book of Revelation because Scotty's on the front row. 
It's one of the signs that the Lord's coming back today. So Scotty was sitting right here where Darcy was sitting, Holly, then my mother-in-law, uh, Ruthie. And about 40 years ago, we were coming back you know, on a winter day in New Brunswick, Canada, for those that are visiting. I grew up on the east coast of Canada. It was snowing very hard, and we had gone to a bodybuilding show. We owned fitness centers, the whole nine. We'd gone to a bodybuilding show in a different city, and we were on our way back, and there was three of us in the car. It was my car. And we were almost back to our hometown, and there was this patch of road, and cars were sliding all over the place. It was full-on, white-out blizzard, and you could see cars in the ditches and everything else. We were driving along, and we could see on the horizon there was this 18-wheeler coming towards us, and the 18 wheel of the back part of it just started to kind of twist. And my car at the exact same time started to twist and there was going to be a merger in the middle. To this day, I can't explain this. This is stranger than fiction. I do not know. Don't ask me afterwards. I do not know what happened. I do remember it's as real in this moment as it was then because I, and I'm loud, I screamed at the top of my lungs because this 18-wheeler and our car, my car, were on a collision course, and it was, I promise you, I'm not exaggerating this, one iota, unavoidable. That would have been the end of us. To this day, I don't know what happened to the truck I didn't blank out. Scotty didn't blank out. The other guy, Mitch, didn't blank out. We just knew that somehow, I don't know if we went through the truck, under the truck. I, I, I don't know. And I'm not saying that they were so far away that we had time to negotiate, and navigate, and get around. That truck was upon us. It was, it was a done deal. All I know is that somehow back, we ended up in some ditch backwards. We don't know what happened to the truck. I'm just telling you, that was a grace. I am convinced of this. That shielded Scotty and Todd and Mitch. I have no other conclusions. You, I know you're going to think I have two heads. You're crazy. You weren't there. I was there. I saw it. I screamed at the top of my lungs because I thought we were about to die. Where would I be? You only know. I'm glad you see through eyes of love. A hopeless case, an empty space, if not for grace. Go ahead and stand with, stand with me at this time. The Bible says... The good news is, and I'm going to have the prayer team uh, come up to the front. We have some of our prayer team here this morning. I usually see Ted because Ted is 6'6". Six, six. And uh, but Ted has lost his standing because Brad is 6'8". It's like Top Gun. Merlin was number one. Merlin is out. Maverick, I can't believe it. You're getting your shot. You're going to Miramar. Ted, you were 6'6". Six, six. You were number one. number one. Brad's in. Brad's going to Miramar. You're top gun. <laughs> What's that got to do with my sermon? Nothing. That's how my mind works. Amen. We've got a few members of our prayer team here this morning. And if you're in a season, when I dismiss, if anybody would like prayer for anything that I was talking about today, a grace, you haven't given your heart to Jesus, don't walk out of here this morning. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I don't want anything from you. I want you to understand the reason and the purposes for which you were created. And I can't do that for you. Only God can connect those dots. God created the dots, and God connects the dots. You know, it's only God who connects the dots. So if you need a grace that saves, if you need a grace, if you find yourself emotionally, physically, and well, between the first and second service, I met with someone that's going through a very difficult time. 
uh, in one of their significant relationships and they find themselves in a wilderness. Well, there's a grace that seeks you in the wilderness. There's a grace that sustains you even when the losses are unimaginable. It just doesn't make everything okay and it puts a smile on your face and you're just perky. But in the midst of that grief, in the midst of that mourning, there's a grace that will get you through it. Through it. It doesn't make everything better. It doesn't make the loss any lighter, but it gets you through it. There's a grace that strengthens it. Sometimes we just need the force of God to come up and kind of shore up our loose ends. Just pour that strength into you and say, listen, I don't got it, but he's got it. I'm on my way. And there's a grace that shields. But like I said, many times we don't even know how good God has been because he shielded, shielded us from things that we weren't even aware of. That car accident that could have happened didn't happen. That tragedy that, that was headed that way was somehow self. I, I don't know. But if you would like prayer for anything related to this grace message, you can come and have prayer for it. The last thing I want to say, I wrote it down, and I thought it was so clever. My message is called, Just Be There. So it ends with a question. I'm such a smarty pants. I'll be there for you. This is what God is saying. I'll be there for you, which is also a Bon Jovi song. But I'll be there for you. But then God says, I'll be there, will you? Just be there. And this is a lesson for me. I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Hamster on a treadmill. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get going. God's like, Todd, there's times when I need you to run. But there are times when you just need to be there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning, thank you for this crowd. Thank you for your sons and daughters. Thank you for people that have an opportunity to experience grace, that they can begin to sense your grace. So whoever I'm speaking to today, and maybe there are so many other things they're sensing and feeling and fearing in their lives, Lord, if we can just be there, something will begin to occur. And sooner or later, we will begin to sense your grace. Let your grace be sensed. Let your grace be felt. Let your grace become real. To every person in here today, I ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.